Good afternoon, good morning for those of you on the other side of, of uh, the continent. It's my honor and pleasure to welcome you today in this uh, series, the uh, third webinar on the series of uh, knowledge sharing platforms and resilience. I'm Sylvie Watts, I'm an agronomist. I'm working with FAO since uh, more than 11 years, working in emergency and re re resilience, um, various type of intervention. And I have the pleasure to, to welcome our uh, guest speaker. But first, I'd like to introduce the, this program as a part of the um, European Union and FAO uh, partnership under the INFORM program, and um, which is um, um, supported by FAO and its uh, resilient strategic program and strategic team. This series of uh, webinars are co-hosted by FAO and the European Union Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development, DG DEFCO. Um, I would like to thank especially our colleagues from EU DEFCO, C1, Rural Development, Food Security and Nutrition, and O3 on Knowledge Management for their very kind support. I would like to remind all of us that this webinar will last about one hour and a half, and it will be recorded. A link will be shared after the event so that all are able to see the presentation again for ease of reference. Following the presentation, we have two guest speakers. Um, our participants will be uh, able to provide comments, answer questions, and using the chat box as it was just explained to you now, which is on the left side bottom part of your screen. We please ask all participants to keep microphone turned off to avoid any sort of a disrupting background noise. The event will have a Twitter coverage under two hashtags KS4, KS4 Resilience and hashtag UNFAO, which are also available in, in this presentation here. Now, the topic, Caisse de Resilience. Why is Caisse de Resilience such an important um, concept and approach for implementing, for supporting resilience in most vulnerable countries? Uh, this webinar is presenting this approach and illustrating the various uh, examples which are ongoing on the ground because it's, it's an approach that FAO has developed and which is extremely important for reducing the vulnerability of most affected uh, communities by a series of, of various types of shocks. It's very adaptable and suitable for the various, the diverse types of context agroecological zone, types of livelihoods, etc. Um, we will hear example from uh, Africa and from the Central America because this approach was developed already back in 2000, 2000 in Honduras and, and, and Guatemala with a sort of a adapted version of it called Community uh, Contingency Fund. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Alexi Bonte, who will be uh, Alexi Bont, sorry for the mispronunciation, who is um, my colleague, dearest colleague agronomist. He is the Resilience Regional Coordinator for Africa Region and currently the FAO representative, representative at Interim in Democratic Republic of Congo. As uh, Alexi has studied agronomy and environmental science in Belgium, and he started his career as agriculture sector in Burkina um, Faso in East Congo, followed by Somalia and Central America, where he's worked for different NGOs. In 2000, he started uh, working with FAO with a broad range of experience in emergency contexts, East Congo, South Sudan, and Uganda, followed by now his regional emergency coordinator role for the Africa region. He is the one who piloted the Caisse de Résilience approach together with national colleagues in Uganda 
and promoted it further in the Central America region, also in, in Central Africa Republic, in Chad, in Liberia, Guinea-Bissau, now in DRC, and also helping out in the Sahel. Our second guest speaker, another agronomist, is a resilience and disaster risk management expert. Is it based in a field sub-regional office for Mesoamerica in Panama. Alberto has a PhD in rural sustainable development and has been working on resilience uh, for many years with us. He has extensive experience in, in rural development and resilience in different contexts such as Niger, Tajikistan, Lebanon, Haiti, Latin, and, and Latin America. Since 2010, he has been supporting on the resilience and disaster risk management operation, especially in Haiti and Latin America and the Caribbean region. Recently, he has been coordinating the um, disaster risk program, disaster risk management program for strengthening the resilience of agricultural livelihood in the dry corridor of the Central America, which is particularly affected by, by drought at the moment. In, he's been contributing to the implementation and evaluation of these community contingency funds, which is a sort of variation of the Caisse de Résilience for, um, for Guatemala and Honduras. Now, after this brief introduction, I'm very pleased, Alexi, to, to give you the floor. We will have Alexi presenting the general um, Caisse de Résilience approach with illustration of some uh, examples of the work in Africa. And this will be followed by Alberto Biggi, who will give us the presentation for the Community Contingency Funds in Central America. Afterwards, we will have the session on question and answer and then conclude the webinar. So, Alexi, thank you. Welcome. I'll pass you the floor. Okay, thank you, Sylvie, and uh, again, thank you uh, all the, the colleagues who are participating. Okay, sorry, I think I had to put the video, but I don't know if it's working or not. So I would like just to thank you, everybody, uh, for attending and participating to the to this uh, session. And um, I hope it will be very useful, and we will get all your contribution at the end of the of the session to make sure we can further improve what uh, the the case of resilience is about. So the case of resilience, uh, we do the presentation in English, but it's a French name, a French title. Uh, we wanted to have the word case because most of the time in FAO we have been working on a very technical side, and uh, we thought that it was very important to illustrate the fact that we have to combine the technical part with um, with the financial part. So it's box, it's like a cash box, but at the same time it's uh, also like a toolbox because it offers a, a menu of options for uh, the communities to better anticipate uh, risk and disaster, but also to better uh, to have better capacity to save local opportunities. So case resilience is not only for disaster management, but it's also for uh, saving opportunities, and we have to take that optimistic. Uh, side of the of the of the approach uh, to give to make sure that people have still hope to to materialize these uh, opportunities for being uh, more resilient. Um, the main message we would like to 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 convey it's it's a community-based approach and consolidating resilience in a participatory and integrated manner. Community, we want to have that that word because the first that's the entities who is affected is the community, is the people. And very often, in most of the countries where we are working, the first to assist, it's also the community and the people. So that's exactly where we really have to, to, to strengthen the capacity of the, of the person is at community level. Secondly, resilience. Uh, we know that there are so many definitions, and I've seen uh, one definition with like 11 verbs in one sentence. But finally, I've been very lucky to see in a, in a, in a document something quite easier to understand, which was saying key sources of resilience is diversification and accumulation of assets. And that's what enlightened us and uh, to, to make sure we can develop a very concrete uh, a concept for, uh, for resilience building. Then participatory, of course, people, they know what are their problems, they know where are their opportunities. The only challenge they have 
it's how to make things happening, and that's why uh, we have to offer that kind of service. Integrated. Again, there is no a single uh, option or a single solution when you have a problem. For example, if you lose the production, what can you do if you don't have access to cash? You have to wait for a distribution or something like that, which is not really, let's say, decent. So that's the reason why we wanted to have this integrated approach uh, with the three pillars that you may already know. So the social, the technical, and the financial that we will um, detail a bit later. Now, in terms of background, I don't think I will go into all these details. Uh, something important, it's, it's not a new invention. We, we were a group of like 10 persons, and we, we looked at our past experience, and we share all the success stories that we had implemented or that we had uh, witnessed. And we had like three sources of inspiration at the end of the discussion. It was from Honduras, like um, Sylvie mentioned, in Uganda and Niger. And at the end, we realized that these three examples, they had something similar which was a combination between technical aspects, like agriculture and environment, and financial services for the same community. And that's, the, in fact, the basis of the development of this uh, approach called the Caso Resilience. An, in, an important uh, point that we also wanted to integrate in that approach is the sustainability. So how can we make sure that the people are engaged on the long term and finding uh, internal incentive measures? And we will come to that later. But that was a very important point. Intern internal incentive measure to make sure the people continue to apply the good practices. So and then in the three examples from Honduras, Uganda, so the financial aspect were um, more related to the saving and loans approach. And in Niger, it was the warrantage. And for the technical part, it was more on the farmer field school approach, or the escuela de campo agricola. Now this is the, the slide which show how the, the whole approach is articulated. So as you can see, we have three main pillars, the social one, the technical one, and the financial one. For um, I think many years within FAO, the majority of the projects were only addressing technical issues for agriculture production and environment. But then we realized that we really need the two other uh, pillars to make sure we have an integrated service and that the people can have this famous menu of options to make sure that they can uh, better um, react or anticipate or prevent uh, the risk. So then, for example, if we take the social part, we work mainly with women association and farmer groups. And then in black, you have a list of activities that have been already uh, implemented. So you don't have to implement all these activities. And of course, these activities will come with through the discussion that you have with the communities, that they will, they will identify by themselves what are the priorities. So you have some activities in terms of social protection, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, uh, cash transfer, like the cash for work, nutrition, inclusion, etc., social inclusion, etc. For the technical um, pillar, because it's resilience, and we know that if your environment is not resilient, then yourself you will not be resilient. So that's the reason why we have to work on the agriculture and the environment uh, sectors. And there again, we have to find we, the population, the communities will have to find the, the, the good practices that they would like to implement. And within these good practices, very often it's, uh, we can categorize them for, let's say, production, community managed disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, natural resource management, and um, post harvest handling. And again, we don't have to implement all these activities, but some of them. Now, finally, the, the last pillar, which is the financial one. Uh, as I said uh, b uh, before, we realized that the saving and loans is one of the, of, of a it's, it's a very interesting approach because uh, most of the people that we are working with, they don't have access to uh, financial services, either because they don't have the guarantee or there is no outreach uh, capacity from the microfinance institution, or sometimes these microfinance institutions are like acting like sharks, and then they get as much as they can from the communities, leaving them uh, even poorer than before the, the survey they were supposed to, to render to that community. So then in the financial uh, pillars, the first, the first step is working on, let's say, the saving and loans. The second one is to make sure they can diversify their, in the, their type of income-generating activities. 
And finally, we have the contingency fund or the social funds that will be detailed by uh, Alberto in a uh, in few minutes. Now, these three pillars, uh, because it's an integrated approach, we have to make some linkages between them. And I will just give some examples. The first one, we can see this uh, blue arrow and uh, making a link between, for example, the cash for work and the saving and loans um, activity. Okay, so the saving and loans, there are some advantages that um, I just mentioned, but one of the, the challenge is if you are in a poor community, then the contribution, the, the buying of the shares to constitute the initial capital, you will do it with little money. And then your initial capital will not be very big, and then you cannot get, uh, let's say, meaningful lo uh, loans. So now, discussing with CARE, who has been the, the NGO who, um, who initiated this uh, VSLA uh, system, we agree that we can do a, cash, a conditional cash transfer, not to the VSLA directly, but to the members of the VSLA, to increase their capacity to buy the shares. So we don't, we don't boost the capital directly. We boost the capacity of the people to buy more shares or at a higher value to increase their own uh, initial capital. And so that's the link that we can do between the social and the financial uh, pillars. And this cash for work, you can do it for productive uh, assets like uh, rehabilitating a road, storage facilities, markets, uh, and so on. But you can also do it uh, for social uh, aspects like building uh, latrines or schools or whatever. So that's the first link that we can do between the social and the financial aspect. The second one is you can also apply this conditional cash transfer to boost the contingency fund, and I guess uh, Alberto will explain how it has been done in, in Central America. Okay, so that was the first link between social and financial. Now, if you look at the arrow, uh, the green one, with conditionality and facility, that's something which is very beautiful that uh, we have seen in Honduras, and the idea comes from the, the communities. So they realize that in so many projects, all, all the good practices that we see on the technical side, we, they implement it during the course of the, the time frame of the, of the project, and then, like the water, because we have constituted constituted of 80% uh, of water, we, we look for the easiest way of life, and then we don't apply the good practices. So they say, now what we have to do is to find a way to oblige ourselves to implement this con these uh, good practices. And they decide to condition the access to the saving and loans by the application of these good practices. So by the, in Honduras, for example, they, they, were, they obliged themselves to, to not to burn, it was forbidden to burn the, the, the field, it was, they, were, they obliged themselves to use the mulching, and also it was forbidden to destroy the trees, to access the, the saving and loans. So like, and as everybody wants to access the saving and loans, like a virtuous circle, cycle, or circle, sorry, all the people were like obliged to apply these good practices, and it created this, um, this uh, very positive and constructive dynamic. So here we can see that they have done uh, this conditionality system for the technical part, but it can also be applied for the social. So if you don't send the girls, your daughters, to the school, you cannot get access to the saving and loans. If you don't monitor the nutrition status of your children below five years old, you cannot access the, the saving and loan system. So that's something important, this conditionality, because it, it's, it proves that the people have a, a serious com commitment and a high level of responsibility to make sure that their, their group is functioning uh, on a long-term basis. What is also nice to, to realize, it's in fact, you have to use the saving and loans, which, is, which provide a very short-term individual benefit to the families, to make sure you can implement activities on a long-term, with a, a long-term impact for general interest, which is the environment. As we know, if we have to improve the environment, we, are, we have to be kind of obliged by laws or by rules because it's a general interest and people, they don't really invest in general interest if they are not obliged. So then they find a way that if you want to get access to something giving you a direct benefit, the saving and loans, you have to apply good practices for improving a general interest. And that's also something very important in the, in the social dynamic to, uh, for responsibility and for commitment. So now the box on the right side uh, is the kind of impact that uh, we are expecting and that we have seen 
in different projects in different countries where we have um, applied the the case de resilience with some communities. So that's in general the the main structure, the articulation of the of the case de resilience. So now we have three short um, slides to explain how, at least within FAO, how we have implemented it. So the technical uh, pillar, it has been applied very often to the farmer fee school approach, which is uh, an extension approach, a participatory extension approach, and working on a basis uh, which is the learning by doing and on a season long uh, cycle. And uh, there's also a facilitator working for a year with the groups and then they have to identify uh, uh, one or two farmers that will lead the groups afterwards. So then it becomes like independent from external sources that's the interest of the farmer fee school. <coughs> and something important is that uh, the farmer fee school is a, an approach which is quite adaptable. We have, uh, let's say, contextualized the farmer fee school for like Karamoja, for example, where we have the agro pastoralist fee school, the APFS, and in different countries um, we have implemented the junior farmer field and life school and also the pastoralist field school I think that was in Kenya and, uh, and uh, Ethiopia mainly. So the, this farmer field school is uh, let's say for the technical part but we are not obliged it's just an illustration of what within FAO we have, uh, we have been doing. For the social mobilization at the beginning of the implementation of the farmer field school uh, let's say at least me within FAO I didn't know that we had uh, an expertise on the social side so we decided to, to, to collaborate and to partner with NGOs and UNICEF for example for all these uh, social protection or uh, training on literacy or conflict resolution or women empowerment and just from for the last let's say a few years for, I, don't, I think it's four or five years that we realized the, 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 the interest of the Dimitra community listener clubs which uh, is also a, uh, an approach developed by FAO and worked a lot on social mobilization and local governance on collective action and transformation uh, gen of gender relations. So that's within FAO we can also uh, work apply let's say this approach for the social uh, pillar. Now uh, on the financial pillow, pillar sorry. <laughs> Uh, within FAO we work a lot on the VSLA but again it's not an obligation. We have uh, in Niger the example of the Warantage and in certain, some other countries we work with the rural bank that the IFAD has developed and I think that's the case in, uh, in Sierra Leone. So we also have to adapt ourselves and the approach uh, with, the, with the, the, the program that we, have, we can find within the, the different country where we can apply the, 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 the case de resilience. I just wanted to mention again uh, one aspect important with the VSLA is the cash transfer. If you don't do the cash transfer, the conditional cash transfer, then the VSLA, okay, they, it will take off but very slowly. So after a disaster, it's better to, to boost the VSLA dynamic through a conditional cash transfer. Like this, you can have impacts a bit uh, faster, especially for populations that have lost everything. Now I know that some colleagues they don't really like the cash transfer and what they've been do doing it's for example you provide um, agro processing machine to the group one or two agro processing machine and the group commit to use the first benefits to ensure that they can increase the initial capital of the VSLA or they, they, they agree to let's say to, to cultivate the cassava field and then the benefit of the, of, uh, the sales of this cassava will uh, contribute to the, the establishment of uh, the VSLA uh, initial capital. So you have different options to, to make sure that uh, the VSLA can take off a bit uh, faster than in a normal uh, situation. Something which is very nice with the VSLA, it's again a participatory and community managed approach and then it's like a, a learning session for the community before moving towards a more structured entity like the microfinance institution. I also wanted to give an example from Honduras where some groups they are now giving themselves loans to other groups but they started like a, a very simple and little uh, VSLA and now they are, they are engaged in, let's say in kind of big business. So now we have seen some details for the three pillars but again 
it has to be very flexible and depend on the needs of the people and the situation you 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 will uh, you will face uh, in the country. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, an important point is the let's say the long-term commitment of the communities. And again, we have this concept of the conditionality that we cannot impose that to all the groups, but we try to promote because without that, there's always a risk that the people will, let's say, give up or abandon the goodwill uh, that they've been uh, expressing during the, the, the time frame of the, of the project. There's one example that I wanted to mention. It's on social inclusion. And some groups, again, in Central America, they decided that every year they have to integrate or to include some very poor family. And very often it's a, a woman with the kids that have been like abandoned by a, a bad guy. And then, like this, it's kind of a social protection, but not done by a government or by an NGO. It's social protection within the communities. Um, so that's uh, on the social part. And another example that I wanted to mention uh, as an impact of uh, a long-term engagement, it's again in Honduras, where they oblige themselves not to cut, not to burn, and the mulching. In like, I think it was in like six years, they changed the landscape of the, the Corredor Seco. So they realized that some temporary river, river they became again a permanent river thanks to the, the landscape and the agroforestry that they, they promoted. And also they, uh, they calculated that they have 40% less losses after a hurricane or a, a drought in the areas where they apply these, condition, these uh, good practices compared to the, the areas where they did not apply. And finally, there's also, I think it's not called a governor or an alcalde, uh, the local authority decided also to apply these uh, good practices through a law. So now it's not only the groups that uh, have to apply these good practices, but even the, the whole uh, province cannot burn, is obliged to do mulching, et cetera, et cetera. So it starts from a small community, but then now it's becoming like institutionalized at political level. Now, this slide is just to give a very short uh, uh, overview of the, the time frame, for example. It started in Uganda, and in 2007, we had this emergency support to returnees going back to their village of origin after like 10 or 20 years of displacement, and it was funded by ECHO. And we just work it, working, we worked on the, on the farmer fee school, et cetera. And after that, uh, we had the visit from a, a colleague from DEFCO, who appreciated the, 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 the project that we did, and she suggested, okay, now can you discuss with Care and see how you could apply the VSLA to the farmer fiscal group that you have been uh, supporting with ECHO? And that's the way it started, at least with FAO, the combination between the VSLA and, uh, and, um, and the farmer fiscal in an emergency situation. And so that's to illustrate also the link between uh, emergency, rehabilitation, and development. So the case de resilience is a very, let's say, useful uh, methodology to ensure this link uh, between the different stages or stages that the population can go through after uh, a disaster. And uh, it's also interesting to notice that in Honduras it started, it started uh, the same way, because they started this from a fiscal after the hurricane meet in uh, 99, and they, they evolved with the, the cash transfer and the, the saving and loan system. Now, okay, this, this, this is just a post that we did uh, in, uh, in Uganda like some few years ago to illustrate how we adapted the farmer fiscal to the agro pastoralist fiscal, so the agro pastoralist area in Karamoja. I will not go through the whole uh, poster, but if you have a look, you will realize that by that time we just had the financial, so the VSLA you can see in the middle of the picture, and the technical side with water conservation, agriculture, livestock, etc. And we didn't have anything on the social. And just a few years later, that discussing and collaborating with NGOs and the donors, that we realized that we need this social part to make sure we can uh, provide a, a more comprehensive uh, service to the communities. Now, as uh, Sylvie mentioned, it's an approach that we can adapt in different contexts and countries. And uh, so we have seen that we did, we started in Uganda and then in Central America it was also done and we, we complemented, completed the, the, the approach. 
but I'm sure that um, Alberto will uh, give some details. But it's more related to natural hazard and climate change uh, issues. Then in Central Africa Republic, I know the colleagues will may also give some uh, some remarks and observation on how it is implemented. But it was more it was even during the war in uh, between 2013 and 14, and the idea was to make sure that the communities can get money and can work again together between the two communities. And in Central Africa, if I'm not wrong, even the, the European Union is considering the case resilience approach for uh, channeling their funds through the, the BECU, the Fonds BECU. But the colleagues will give more uh, details on that, I guess. In Liberia, uh, uh, Ebola did not have a serious impact on the production. And, but what was very striking, it's all the women association who worked with the VSLA, they lost completely the VSLA because there was a quarantaine and they could not move from one village to another village because the, the, the local authority impeded the, the movement of population during almost two months. So then they were not able to do PT trade and then they had to use all their capital just for the surviving. So we decided to do a cash transfer to that, uh, to these uh, women association and the, the work they had to do was a warning um, campaign for Ebola to the other villages when the quarantine was lifted. And then they, they earned the money through that contract and then they were able to replenish the, their VSLA uh, system. And then we went to other countries like Guinea-Bissau where the focus was on legalization of women groups like this they can access other services. And now in Mali, Malawi, Chad, uh, there are also some initiatives on the, on the case of resilience but I think we can, we can skip the details. So the implementi implementation arrangements, of course, it's not one institution that can do the whole uh, case of resilience. So it needs and it calls for partnership. Uh, for example, for the implementation in Uganda, we worked with, I think it was like almost 30 NGOs, national and international, and they were the, the real actors on the ground to implement it. And if it was just channeling and uh, providing a coordination role uh, to make sure that we are all in the same uh, direction. But also we can uh, collaborate and partner for specific expertise like uh, literacy, training on women empowerment, etc., where FAO does not have any uh, comparative advantage. So the time frame, it's not an emergency project. You can start by an, an emergency project, but you need like two years, I think, uh, as a minimum to make sure you can really start the, the case resilience implementation. The, the, the opportunity that we have with the Case resilience. It's you can you can base your program on ongoing uh, projects. Like for example, here in DRC, we have not really started the case resilience, <coughs> but um, we have the farmer fee school and we have the club Dimitra. So now we will try to to coordinate these two um, uh, approach and make sure that we have, for example, the VSLA that will assist the, the groups under the farmer fee school and the, and the Dimitra approach. In terms of budget, it's very flexible. So if you want to give it a minimum, it should be like around three to four thousand dollars per group. And if you want to provide a very holistic approach and uh, kind of services, then you can go up to ten thousand. It depends on the needs and, of course, the generosity of the people paying the taxes. Now, uh, some impact from the field. I think that's I think you can read directly uh, what uh, some impact that we found from Uganda. There, there have been like two mission evaluation missions, one from the Swiss Corporation, if I remember well, and one from FAO. And um, okay, I, I don't think I have to read. Uh, we can read or you can read later. Now there are also some impacts on the living conditions, especially in car, so just during the, the war. And again, here I don't think I will go uh, through all the details, but something very very important, it's self-confidence. The people in, in Bangui, we know, not in Bangui, in Ka, we know that some of them, they've been uh, like uh, displaced for nine months and uh, in a very difficult situation. So when they went back and they, they saw this comprehensive uh, support, it gave them self-confidence because they also felt like uh, in the driving seat of the, of the program because it's very participatory. And again, there are some, a lot of impacts, sorry, which are not related directly to agriculture. And that's the beauty of the of these approach. For example, paying fees, economic activities, activity uh, for income generation, etc. So which are not completely related to agriculture. And with the the VSLA, in fact, at the beginning we wanted we we 
not prevented, but we were expecting that they were they will be uh, investing their money in agriculture. And when we realized that they, they were doing pity trade, we were a bit skeptical. But discussing with them, we realized that doing pity trade, a non-farm activity, was in fact very intelligent. Because the agriculture, you get your uh, income every three or four months. So you get, let's say, a big, in brackets, a big income every four months. But then with the pity trade, you get a, small in, a smaller income, but every two days. And this combination of small income every two, three days and the big incomes every three, four months, that's also very interesting for the residents and mitigating the, the shocks uh, at family level. Now in terms of, uh, let's, I don't know if it's really a conclusion, but just to give some uh, final words, uh, this case de resilience, it's really feasible. It looks like something heavy, but it's not. It's just a question of, uh, of willingness and a good heart and good uh, collaborators and good partners and to make sure we all want to go in the same direction. This is also a very nice uh, entry point for linking emergency and development um, program. What I really like is the, the observation from, uh, from uh, Central Africa. It gives self-confidence to people and really it gives hope. When I go to the field uh, in the villages in Congo, I, I try to put myself in the seats of these young kids. So they are born in the middle of Sanku and they know they will spend their whole life there with no electricity, no television, maybe no cell phone. So it's difficult to have hope. And at least these uh, case de resilience, it offer like uh, hope and uh, energy to, to see the, the life in another way. Then we have other small conclusion. Right? It's, uh, it can promote cross-sector approach and partnership. It's uh, well appreciated by all the partners, especially um, the population, the government. I think in, in Central Africa, even the ministry want to use it as a, as a main, uh, like a flagship program for the government. Also some donors, huh? we have, I think now it's like 15 donors that uh, have been supporting this approach. It can also fit into major initiatives like AGIR, uh, in the Sahel, SHARE in East Africa, the Fond Beku, and now here in, uh, in Congo, we are joining forces with WFP and we will uh, develop a program which is uh, taking the, the good aspect of the P4P, Purchase for Progress, and the good aspect that we can combine with the uh, case of resilience. We have already talked with UN Women to make a UN joint program and using the, the case of resilience approach. Um, let's say more or less, uh, uh, it's very important also for the, the Women uh, Association and to, for Women Empowerment. And we have, I think more or less, we have supported like 10,000 groups from Central America and in Africa. And uh, in terms of budget, it's more or less like 50 million, I think, of dollars that have been mobilized from Malawi to, I think now Senegal is involved, Mali, uh, Uganda, Congo, and uh, the countries in, in Central America. So then, as you can see, there's already uh, a lot of experience. We can still expand this to, to other countries. And uh, I hope uh, you appreciate you appreciate the, the kind of, um, of initiative, and uh, I hope we will have a nice discussion during the open session, and now I will uh, give back the floor to Sylvie, or I don't know, maybe directly Alberto, who will give us uh, some details on the, the financial aspect that they are implementing in, um, in, um, in Central America. Thank you. Alex, Alex, thank you very much. This was very um, nicely presented. We heard you very well. And Alberto, if you're ready, we pass you the floor from, um, from uh, I think you are in Panama at the moment. Over to you.